what we're going to talk about today is shift gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about sports concussions. And this is work that stemmed out of the 2013 American Academy of Neurology evidence-based uh, sports concussion management guidelines. So an important caveat is for any evidence-based guideline, there has to be evidence. Okay? And that sounds self-evident, but for example, there was no discussion of the rates of concussion in boxing, not because we think boxing doesn't cause concussions, but because there are no published studies. So imagine that. Um, so that's one of the limitations of evidence-based medicine. But from this effort, we were able to come across with um, objective guidelines for management of concussion. And I'm going to just sprinkle a little bit of basic science um, in a few places where I think it maybe uh, provides some insight. So what is a concussion, first of all? Well, it's the mildest form of traumatic brain injury, perhaps. We define it sort of clinically as a biological process that affects the brain, results in brain dysfunction, uh, and is caused by physical force imparted to the brain. So that's pretty broad, okay? We know in general that the clinical symptoms start early after concussion, although they don't have to start right away. We sometimes see delayed presentation after the game is over, or sometimes even the next day. Um, we know that less than 10% of clinically diagnosed concussions have a loss of consciousness. So that's different from when I grew up, uh, when you had to be knocked out cold or else you know, nobody even took a look at you. An important thing about concussions as a form of traumatic brain injury is that many of the symptoms are related to acute pathophysiology, and thus they get better over time. Okay? And the real question is how many people get better versus who have chronic symptoms, and is there a cumulative effect of concussions? Because in the sporting situation, unlike in other forms of accidental TBI, there is an implicit uh, assumption that you're going to, uh, to uh, readdress those risks. So if I fall off a ladder and the doctor tells me, don't fall off ladders, I'm going to try not to do that. But if I, you know, wreck my dirt bike, um, I may actually want to go back and do that activity even if the doctor tells me not to. Um, and then, again, a little different here is CT scans or gross neuroimaging is normal. So mild TBI and concussions is not typically associated with big structural lesions in the brain. We can think of it more as a dysfunction of the brain. So I line this up as sort of facts and fictions. And so, you know, one of the fictions is that girls don't get concussions, right? This is a boy's problem. Um, and the reality is boys get more concussions because they play football. But actually, if you compare sports that have similar rules, girls have a higher rate of concussion. So here's some of the evidence for that. So using similar sports, which are defined in this study as uh, baseball, softball, uh, basketball, and soccer, which all have the same rules between genders, you can see girls have about a two to one rate of concussions. You can see obviously around 2005, 2006, the rates of diagnosing concussions went up but this gender disparity remained. This is concussions by sport, and so you can see why overall boys get more concussions, because girls don't play tackle football by and large, uh, and that constitutes a large percentage of total concussions. When you look at incidence rates, though, concussions per 1,000 exposures, and you have boys versus girls, and these are high school and collegiate cohorts, if you again look at the sports that have similar rules, you can see in general the girls are having higher rates of concussion. And now why is this? There could be hormonal differences. Some people say maybe women are more honest about reporting their symptoms. But a lot of the research right now is focusing on, focusing on something uh, uh, maybe more mundane, but, but relevant is, is actually musculoskeletal strength in the neck and the ability to mobilize the head on impact seems to be an important factor. Okay, so what test can we use? You know, for, for those of you who participated in sports maybe in college or for, for you who have kids in high school or college, um, you know, sometimes you, you get the reassuring word from the coach that, you know, our school tests for concussion. So what miraculous test is this? Well, there's, there's no test actually that single-handedly diagnoses concussion, okay? So if your school says they're doing that, uh, they're doing a test, but that is certainly um, not the only test. Concussion remains a clinical diagnosis with those characteristics that I indicated to you on the first slide, and that can't be determined from a single sort of litmus test, and there's certainly no blood test or MRI scan that can diagnose concussion with good specificity and sensitivity.
Um, we do know that there are many tools that a clinician can use to assess a patient and help determine whether there was a concussion, which include standardized scales, certain types of uh, examination for balance or reaction time, cognitive testing, and this can be both computerized and traditional paper and pencil neuropsych. But again, no single test will do it by itself. I'm going to show you a few of these tools. So this is part of the sports concussion assessment tool, the first part, which is called the graded symptom checklist. It's pretty straightforward. It's, do you have any of these symptoms? You can see it, maybe it's hard to see, but there are about 20 symptoms from headache all the way down to trouble falling asleep and feeling more emotional. And the uh, athlete or the injured person rates it um, on a scale of zero to six. Okay. Now, there are caveats with the use of this, and particularly some people have more symptoms than other at baseline, right? Some people are headachey people, okay? What about kids, younger kids? Can they fill out this questionnaire with the same accuracy? Do you have their parents also fill it out? Those become caveats that end up being important and explain why a one test fits all doesn't work for concussions. Another part of the SCAT-3 includes a cognitive assessment. Okay, the standardized, of ass standardized assessment of concussion is kind of a mini mental status exam, a very abbreviated type of neuropsych testing that can be administered by a non-physician just to quickly determine whether there are memory or attentional problems, typically within the first few days after concussion. And you can see it focuses on orientation, intermediate memory, um, and, and concentration with digits and months in reverse order. In the middle, while you're waiting for delayed recall, people will often stick in a neurological examination, and one important component of that neurological examination is an assessment of balance. The simplest assessment of balance that's been validated is the balance error scoring system, which involves the athlete assuming these three different postures, both on a firm surface and actually more difficult on a foam pad, and you count how many postural mistakes they make um, in the course of 20 seconds. And then remember at the end, go back and test the delayed recall. There are also multiple computerized cognitive tests, and here I'm not going to go into why one brand is different than the other, um, but suffice to say that many of these have been marketed as sort of the one-size-fits-all test for concussion, and one of the reasons why that doesn't work, um, I'll cite published literature in this case rather than anecdote, but there's actually a study published uh, from Australia McDeezy's the author, and what they did was they had a group of uh, Australian football players um, sit down with pitchers of water, and they would drink water, and then after so many minutes, certain members would be allowed to take the test. And they did this over the course of several hours. You can imagine at the end of those several hours that the folks who'd been drinking water heavily um, were starting to have some other things on their mind, um, and they actually performed in the level of the concussed athlete. So they, they termed this micturition urgency. They had to pee really bad, and it actually knocked their test scores on these computerized tests into the concussed range. So again, the tests are sensitive, but they're not always specific for concussion. Right, another myth, perhaps, that there's no proven management to improve outcomes after concussion. So, you know, why are we making such a big deal about it, right? Does, you know, people are going to get better. So there, the fact is, actually, that um, educating people and providing anticipatory guidance in terms of how they go back to activity significantly reduce the duration of symptoms and anxiety and reduce the percentage of individuals that develop chronic post-concussion syndrome. So 10 or 15 percent of people after concussion won't get better in the typical two to four weeks. They may take longer and they develop this chronic symptomatology, but just by doing some education and anticipatory guidance, helping them through their activity in that early symptomatic phase, the percentage of that can be reduced by about 15 or 20 percent. So for a little psycho psychological counseling, um, you get a pretty big bang for your buck there. Um, another fact, and there's strong evidence to support this, is that protecting the concussed individual from repeat injury is extremely important. Not so much that they're going to develop second impact syndrome and have their brain swell, but because after concussion, you have marked increased risk for getting a subsequent concussion and having more symptoms. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the subsequent slides. Okay. So with regards to the anticipatory guidance, 
especially from what we've he hear in the newspaper recently, you, you almost think that if you get a single concussion, you're doomed to develop tau pathology in your brain and you're going to become demented and you might as well forget it. And the reality is there's, there are multiple studies, prospective studies, showing symptom resolution in two, one to two weeks, maybe two to three weeks in younger individuals uh, for about 90%. So most people are going to get better, and people should be informed that that's what we expect. You're going to recover from this. Okay? We don't want you to injure your head before you've recovered, but it is possible to recover. In fact, probable. Okay? This is one study. This is done specifically in kids, but there are four or five studies in, in adults also um, showing how if there's a little psychological intervention early after the injury, explaining the injury, explaining the typical symptoms, what's the expected time course, uh, that not every single headache you're going to have for the rest of your life is due to the concussion, um, that type of brief psychological counseling um, actually significantly reduces different metrics which are validated. So here's a post-concussion symptom checklist, and I would focus on the green bar, which are the mild TBI group that had, no, uh, had the intervention, and the red bar, which are the concussed group that had no intervention. And you can see for multiple parameters, including three that were statistically significant, um, there's a reduction in their post-concussion symptom checklist. Um, another parameter here is the child behavior checklist, which some of you may be familiar with. And again, you can see similar uh, reductions. So just this brief intervention can statistically significantly reduce uh, symptomatology at three months. Now, we also know there are risk factors for more prolonged recovery, and these are all supported by evidence, and they're all listed here in the slide. Hopefully, they'll be able to make the slides available, or you'll be able to look at it online. Um, but here we classify the number of studies that support um, that these particular risk factors are associated with longer recovery. So a history of prior concussion, being younger, that means high school compared to college. There actually haven't been comparative studies less than high school, so we're a bit flying blind for younger kids. And then certain type of symptoms, headache, fogginess, histories of prior headache, history of prior learning disabilities, these things have also been associated with taking longer to recover uh, from concussion. Okay. Now, in terms of that vulnerability to repeat injury, okay, it could be that if you have a concussion and you're more likely to get another concussion, it's because you're a butthead, right? You just are really aggressive when you play a certain sport and you lead with your head, or there can be different styles of play that can predispose you. Or maybe you have a genetic predisposition, okay? And those are things that might be hard to get rid of. Okay? But it turns out there are also ways, and we can use laboratory studies to evaluate intrinsic vulnerability of the brain. Uh, and these are in rodent models, and this is Dr. Mayumi Prinz, a colleague of mine at UCLA. She looked at metabolic changes in the brain that occur after repeat mild closed head injury in the rodent, in the young rat. These are juvenile rats. We see a spike in glucose metabolism after injury, followed by a metabolic depression. And that depressed metabolism correlates with an impairment of working memory using the novel object recognition task. Now, in the animal model, you don't have to worry about them being aggressive fighters, and you don't necessarily have to worry too much about genetic variability. Um, so she can just separate two injuries, in this case by six days, and she found that they have very similar patterns of depressed metabolism and memory that then recover. If, however, the second injury is superimposed before complete recovery of the first injury, we see greater metabolic depression and greater working memory impairment that then lasts a longer period of time. So in some ways, that, that suggests that there is an intrinsic biological vulnerability, at least in the early phase after uh, the concussion. Does that have any clinical relevance? Well, this is a study in, in Italian uh, male athletes who had concussion, and they had MR spectroscopy. And what Vagnosi and colleagues found was that, I don't know if you can see that, well, yeah, you can. There's a reduction in the N-acetyl aspartate to creatinine ratio um, that occurs early after concussion, and that it takes up to 30 days for full recovery. Now, what was more difficult and more challenging in these clinical studies is that the correlation with clinical symptoms was not very good. But in this study, they, were, they didn't use any standardized symptom quantification. They just asked the athletes if they had symptoms. And imagine, by day three, they all said they were feeling better. So because of that, some of the athletes went back to play too soon. And they stayed in the study, but their data were analyzed separately here by the, by the uh, black diamonds. And what you can see is that actually the metabolic depression was worse and took longer to recover. So perhaps there are some correlates between what we can learn in the laboratory and what may happen um, in real people. 
Now, what about the whole idea of just what concussion, getting risk for concussion, and whether symptoms are worse? Well, the, this is a larger, um, popul more population-based study with over 1,000 concussions uh, in collegiate athletes. And what they found was that the more prior concussions an athlete had had, his risk of having another concussion was increased. So if you've had concussions in the past, there's a greater risk for concussions during this study. And those who had more concussions in the past, this group, tended to have a longer period of time that it took them to recover from concussions that occurred during the study. Now, one other thing that happened in this, since this was a prospective study, um, of course, there's always recall bias when you ask somebody to remember if they had concussion. But during the study, there were 12 concussions that occurred under prospective observation. And 11 of those 12 occurred within this relatively early time window after the first concussion, suggesting, again, there may be this window of metabolic vulnerability in the first few weeks. What about return to play? There's a fiction out there now that you need complete rest until every single symptom has resolved to have optimal recovery. Okay. And actually, the facts that are out there suggest that extremes of activity are associated with longer recovery, um, but you don't necessarily need to, have to stop all activity. And in fact, there's some basic science data that suggests controlled exercise may actually be beneficial. So this is work from Grace Griesbach, who's a colleague of mine at UCLA. And you guys are all familiar with the running wheel. Voluntary exercise upregulates BDNF expression in the hippocampus and results in cognitive enhancement. In fact, the amount the animals run seems to correlate with their BDNF. So I did make sure this morning, even though it was hot, to get out there and get some running in on, out in Red Rock Canyon. So I encourage you guys to check that out if you can. Um, but after traumatic brain injury, that relationship between how much you run and how high your BDNF goes is absent. And in fact, the early voluntary running is associated with worse cognition um, using Morris water maze. If, however, she waits a week after injury, um, then you can see that there's a restoration of this relationship between BDNF and running. And it turns out the cognition actually gets better faster. So there's a sweet spot somewhere in there where too early exercise causes a problem, but if you institute the exercise after a certain time period, it actually facilitates recovery and helps them get better faster. Now, what do we have for clinical data? We don't have great clinical data, but we have some. This is a study of high school athletes who retrospectively gauge their activity post-concussion from level zero to level four, with level four meaning I did everything after concussion the way I did before, and level zero being essentially couch potato. Um, and what you can see here is that cognitive performance was highest in the group that had moderate level of activity after concussion. And in fact, if you looked at the symptom scores, they were exactly inverse, so that they had the same group that had the moderate level of activity had the lowest symptom scores. Now that's retrospective, and again, there are problems with studies like that. This is only a class three sort of study, uh, but there's a better study that was just published earlier this year, which is a prospective study with several hundred um, high school athletes. And what they did was they, they had a predetermined scale of activity that each, each individual was instructed on at the time they presented with their concussion. So they could prospectively mark how much activity they were having, including how much time they texted and spent on the computer, et cetera. And what they found when they divided that cohort of 335 uh, kids into quartiles of activity and tracked recovery, um, what you can see here is actually the first three quartiles all got better pretty quickly. It was the quartile with the highest level of activity, so the top 25% most active individuals were the ones that took the longest. And so this suggests that sort of, the, again, the extreme of activity um, took longer to get better, but you didn't necessarily have to stop all activity. The groups that were in the more moderate range got better as quickly as the groups that were in the low range of activity. All right, and then of course what you hear about or read about in the news and on, on the New York Times about dementia, uh, we, we would really come to the conclusion that repeated concussions in kids are gonna inevitably lead to dementia, depression, and suicide. Okay. The reality is, is that it's very hard to create, figure out what the tie is between acute traumatic brain injury and chronic neurodegeneration. The causal data just hasn't, doesn't exist yet. What we do know is that repeated concussions can lead to measurable cognitive impairment, 
particularly in professional adult athletes. And similar studies, which are done in amateurs or high school or college students, have, have been sort of wishy-washy in terms of whether they actually show lasting impairment. So I don't have any ax to grind here particularly. I'm just going to show you what the studies are. So th these are the six or seven studies um, that involve professional athletes who took chronic um, sort of neurocognitive testing after exposure to multiple injuries. And what the consistent finding was, whether it was rugby or football or soccer or boxers or even professional horse racers, was that all of those professional athletes scored lower on cognitive tests. And in fact, if they measured whatever surrogate they could for dose response, however many concussions they had or how many years they participated in the sport or how many fights the boxers were in, there was always a dose response if the study tried to find it. So that's pretty consistent. You know, seven out of seven studies found an impairment, and the six of, of those that actually tried to measure dose response found a dose response independent of the type of sport. So I think that, that's a pretty strong finding. It, we don't know whether these patients have degeneration, but they have cognitive impairment. By the same criteria, if you look at the studies in amateur sports, and now this was up until 2013 is when this review was done, but you can see there were more studies that were done in amateurs, okay? But half of them found cognitive impairment and half of them did not find associated cognitive impairment. So does that mean it's okay for your kid to go out and bang his head? I don't, I don't think so, but what it, what it probably means is that the effect size is not as robust as it is because the levels of exposure are less and also possibly because not enough time has elapsed to, to really detect chronic impairment, so you do have to be uh, cautious about that. But in, in any case, you know, it doesn't show that there is neurodegeneration and suggests that the effect may be less for individuals who participate in sports at a lower level of, uh, of activity. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, we saw a slide earlier today about this. This is the tau deposition that has been reported in autopsy studies, um, predominantly by the Boston group, but others have also shown this. And the only thing I want to point out here is that although we have heard a lot about this, and it certainly is concerning, is just remember that from case studies, you can't determine risk. You can't really determine incidence or prevalence. You need a different kind of study to do that. The NCAA and the Department of Defense uh, just announced the Grand Alliance where they're going to prospectively follow cohorts of collegiate athletes, um, whether they had concussions or not, to see over time if there's a separation in terms of cognitive impairment. And that may help discern at least over time whether there is uh, a causal relationship. But it, otherwise with case reports, it tells you something is there, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what the relative risk is, unfortunately. So to wrap up then, we know that boys get more concussions overall, but in comparable sports, girls actually have higher rates. Concussion's a clinical diagnosis, and there's no single test that's going to make that diagnosis for you. You need to use all the tools. Concussion management currently involves individualized assessment. There's no rating scale that can tell you, oh, I had a bad concussion, or, you know, I hate to hear this, I've had a mild concussion. You don't really know if it was a mild concussion until you see how long it took the person to recover. Um, it is important, however, to remove them from contact risk during that window of vulnerability when they're more likely to get another injury and when another injury is more likely to be more severe. It's important probably to be avoiding the extremes of activity or at least the upper extreme of activity. They should tone down what, what's being done after concussion, at least until symptoms start to improve. And we know that chronic cognitive impairment is pretty consistently seen in studies of professional athletes with high levels of exposure and may have a dose response. Uh, in amateurs, we don't see that same relationship. It doesn't mean there's no risk, but it means perhaps that risk is less. Um, lastly, I want to talk about how sport changes all of our behavior. And so it's pretty rare that I would make a shameless plug like this, but I had to get here early enough last night to watch the Stanley Cup and watch the the LA Kings uh, bring the cup home for the second time in three years. Um, and secondly, I wanted to point out that it's important when we go out into our communities that we can actually also mitigate traumatic brain injury through preventive measures. And this little video hopefully will illustrate that. Oops. If I can get the mouse back here. <laughs> 
So thanks to the Canada Hockey Association for that public service announcement. And thanks for your attention.